David, I'm sorry. It should normally take five hours to drive from Belfast to Cork. I yep. took seven and three quarter hours. You, you did, Tim. You did. It's quite amazing, really. But I must say, Wicklow is a lovely part of Ireland. Yes, we're in Cork. All right, I went to Cork via. Anyway, we're here at a very, very important site in Irish history, one that really, really will resonate. I, basically, I want to get you thrown out of the Orange Order, so I'm going to take your photograph here. And like I say, it's an important site, a very tragic site. But I think, you know, I think it's so solemn. I think we could say a wee decade of the rosary while we're here. Oh, you just carry on. Here we are yes. at Beal Nabla where Michael Collins, the hero of the Irish War of Independence, was shot. It's, it's not what you expect to see at a site. Like, I mean, I expect it probably like a visitor centre on the site and, and so on. I, I feel quite emotional here because I'm a big fan of Michael Collins. I know you're not, but Bill Nabla for me is one of the uh, most tragic scenes in Irish history. Uh, not the most tragic, obviously, after the Battle of the Boyne and the plantation and stuff like that. And it's a major historical spot because it, it, it possibly changed the course of Irish history, of course. That, well, that I, think it, I think it definitely did. He was born here in County Cork. He uh, spent a lot of time in London. Yeah. Came back to fight in the uh, 1916 Easter Rising. Collins was based at the GPO during the fighting. After the Easter Rising, he was interned in Wales at Frongok Prison Camp. At the time, Collins was relatively unknown, and one police report described him as nothing to worry about. On his release from prison, Collins threw himself into Republican politics. The execution of the Easter Rising's leaders and the threat of conscription to provide troops for the World War led to a steep rise in Sinn Féin's popularity. Republicans won stunning by-election victories in 1917 and 1918, many of them organised by Collins. The British arrested some key Sinn Féin leaders, including Arthur Griffith and Eamon de Valera, under the guise of an alleged German plot. Now, Collins had got wind of this these planned arrests and he had managed to evade them, which meant for a crucial part of 1918, he was one of the few senior figures in Sinn Féin at liberty. The general election in December 1918 was a huge electoral victory for Sinn Féin. Apart from an Ulster, they won the vast majority of seats. Sinn Féin, of course, refused to take their seats at Westminster, instead forming their own parliament in Dublin, called Doyle Erin. We're here in the, uh, the mansion house where the first Doyle was held. He's made finance minister. He's minister for finance, as you mentioned, which is a hugely important job. And he remains obsessed with money and finance throughout his career. The whole raison d'etre of the first Doyle was to set up an alternative functioning government in Ireland. In order to do that, they needed money. The principal way Collins did that was through a national loan. But he's also president of the Supreme Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the clandestine, secretive uh, organisation, oath-bound to achieve uh, an Irish Republic. Uh, and he's on the Sinn Féin executive. And he's also director of intelligence for the IRA. Essentially, any bullet that's fired out of an IRA going during the War of Independence has been acquired by Michael Collins through a complex network of finance and arms acquisition. What are most unionists, do they know of Michael Collins? Do they, do they, what do they that, think of him? Do they have any view of, do they just think he's an IRA terrorist? They would see him, yes, as being a, a sort of a terrorist and organising all the, the attempts to wipe out the, the intelligence in Dublin and so forth. Collins was not the Chief of Staff of the IRA during the War of Independence. That job was held by Richard Mulcahy. Collins has a lot of power in Dublin, but not necessarily when you begin to look at the decentralised IRA. The Michael Collins of reality is not someone in an Irish volunteer uniform. It's not someone with a revolver permanently strapped to its side. It's a guy on a bicycle in a trench coat and a hat cycling around Dublin with a fountain pen. And yes, some really deadly orders emanated from that fountain pen. One of the groups operating under Collins's remit was the, the group known as the Squad. And they were active in a number of the high profile executions of British agents who were proving to be a particular thorn in Collins' side. You have to keep a step ahead of British intelligence. And they are intent on infiltrating the IRA and bringing the IRA down. Uh, and of course that leads to very clinical, as you say, very cold uh, decisions about taking out people. That requires a rootlessness, uh, and there's no doubt that Collins has that rootlessness. What Collins had in terms of his um, in intelligence circle was key people in key places. So, for example, Lily Murnahan in Dublin Castle, she finds out the addresses of all the agents. He's the sort of guy that you assume would have a little qualms about 
a lot of these activities that went on. Whether they were affecting friends or foe, it didn't seem to matter. It would probably be disappointing to some of the people who see him as the arch terrorist to see just how little he was involved in the terrorism he's alleged to be in. 196 people were executed by the IRA during the War of Independence for informing, for being spies. Now, they weren't all informers and they weren't all spies. And sometimes the War of Independence is used as an umbrella to settle other scores. From the summer of 1920 onwards, the British were starting to put the squeeze on the Republican campaign and Collins's organisation was feeling under pressure, so he felt that there was a need to hit back. On the 21st of November 1920, the IRA assassinated 15 members of British intelligence. Later that same day, the British Army indiscriminately shot into a crowd attending a Gaelic match at Croke Park, killing 14 people. The day became known as Bloody Sunday. The decision to assassinate the British intelligence officers is normally attributed to Michael Collins. In his most recent biography by Anne Dolan and William Murphy, they say this was a Dublin Brigade operation and Michael Collins was not the central organiser of, of uh, Bloody Sunday, that his role in it was actually overstated. The full truth about Michael Collins seems to elude us in the same way as he managed to evade the British throughout the War of Independence. The Collins Barracks Museum in Dublin gives us a better picture of the real man behind the myth. These slippers came to us in the 1950s from a woman called Bridget O'Connor, and she was the wife of Bat O'Connor. Michael mm -hmm. Collins stayed, apparently, a fair bit in their own personal house. These were the slippers that he always wore when he was staying in their house secretly as a safe house. I got talking to some members of the family. Their mother remembered Michael Collins coming to their house, playing horsey with the children of the house, um, which gives us an entirely different view of Michael Collins as a person. We see this very personal aspect of it, but yet Michael Collins was quite a cold, calculating person in, in terms of what he did. Certainly in terms of maybe what you would consider like his job, I suppose, mm -hmm. as a military man in the revolution. But I guess, again, what the objects give us is that fuller picture that that was only one aspect of his personality. Eamon de Valera was president of the Doyle. In June 1919, he left for America to try to gain international recognition for an independent Ireland and to raise finance. When he left, de Valera was the leading figure in the Republican movement. De Valera was out of Ireland for most of the period from the summer of 1919 to December 1920. He returned to Ireland to discover that Collins now was seen as the big figure in Ireland and I think that came as a bit of a shock. I think the De Valera Collins issue is all is still very complicated, still very controversial even to this day. I mean, there's a, there's a De Valera Appreciation Society who still feel very aggrieved at the how De Valera has been treated as opposed to Collins, because Collins is still the massive hero. His grave in Glass Nevin, you know, hundreds of people go to it every single day. There are flowers laid out. We've been here for half an hour and there's been a steady stream of people coming up and down to, to you know, pay respects to him. If you read some of his speeches, they're indistinguishable from Eamon De Valera. You know, this sense of an indestructible Gaelic culture, civilization, and spirit. He eulogizes the west of Ireland, Achill Island. That's how Ireland can be reborn as a Gaelic civilization. He's hostile it's, it's to hardly socialism. Ireland, McGee. Excuse me, are you, are you Eamon de Valera? Uh, yes, I am. It is him. Oh my God, I can't believe it. It's Eamon de Valera. It's really you. Oh, I'm so excited. Why, thank you. I need to ask you something. Ask me anything at all. Can you get me Michael Collins' autograph? Uh, pardon me? And me? Get me Michael Collins' autograph too? Oh, we love Michael Collins. Oh, you're so lucky, Mr. De Valera. You get to hang out with Collins. Oh, he is so dishy. Oh, he's so cool. What's he like in real life? I bet he's brilliant. Is he just brilliant? I bet he is. I bet he is. Of course he is. He's the hero of the War of Independence. Yeah, he was the best in the War of Independence. <coughs> I actually was involved in the war myself. Yeah, right. Whatever. So can you get us Collins' autograph? I'm afraid not. I could give you my autograph if you want. No, you're all right. He's a cut above everybody else in the, in the free state. Devil De Valera, do you think? Oh, Valera, just... See, there's no film about Devil Valera comparable to Collins, is there, really? He's a, a weirdo, Devil Valera. 
Oh, a weirdo. That's an interesting, <laughs> an interesting political uh, summing up of De Valera there in his career. Okay. De Valera was concerned that some of the tactics and the ruthlessness was not doing the Republican movement any favour internationally. What De Valera wanted were spectaculars that would create international headlines. De Valera and Collins may have disagreed on tactics, but in July 1921, they agreed to a ceasefire with the British government. Both the British and the Irish had good reasons for agreeing to a truce. Collins would have been well aware that after two and a half years, the intense pressure and the continuing pe pressure by the British on the IRA was starting to have a toll. It made sense to the British because having set up Northern Ireland in June of 1921, they effectively had solved the Ulster part of the Irish question, which left them free to negotiate with the Southern Irish. Cormac, a lot of people might be surprised to learn that Michael Collins was actually elected to the Northern Ireland Parliament. There were six uh, Sinn Féin uh, people elected in, to the first Northern Ireland Parliament in May 1921, and Michael Collins was one of them. And this, this was his constituency in South Armagh. The truce has happened by so now. The truce is the key thing so, here. So, so he, he, was, he was a wanted man. Yeah, he was a wanted man and was on the run basically up until 11th of July. Uh, 921. So after that, he was out in the open. And this is his first big public appearance. He arrived here at 12 o'clock noon in this hotel. He's between 20 and 30,000, apparently, are there to hear him crystallise in many ways his thoughts on Ulster. Collins gave this somewhat conciliatory speech saying, look, we want everyone who's Irish to be part of the Irish nation, including unionists, you know. However, just after Collins spoke, he's, uh, his great friend and ally, Ono Duffy from Monaghan, who was deputy chief of staff of the IRA at the time, he said that we want unionists to be in United Ireland, but if they're not, we will use lead against them. So basically, Colin says we want conciliation, and old Duffy comes on and goes, ooh, ah, up the rah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> like a lot of other Sinn Féiners believed that partition would go away if the British just left Ireland. Unionists would be happy to come into Dublin's fold, which was a total misunderstanding of unionist uh, opinion. When the truce came into effect, Peace talks began between the Irish and the British. The Irish wanted a 32-county republic, but the British weren't prepared to concede that. Feeling within the Conservative majority coalition government, feeling within the empire more generally, concerns about the impact of Irish independence on India, all of those things prevented Lloyd George from being in a position to simply concede a republic. De Valera had gone and had been told in no uncertain terms he would not get a republic. He would get dominion status at best. It would be called an Irish free state. So all the various terms of the, the headline issues of the treaty were on the table in July of 21. They were said to De Valera verbatim by Lord George. And in a way, the acceptance of the invitation to go to London was already an acceptance of the compromise because they knew that they weren't going to be able to bring back a republic. Does that mean that De Valera and Collins and the rest of them failed to tell the troops, as it were, listen, you're not getting a republic. How do you prepare the IRA, say, for, for the compromise that's coming? IRA operators... I don't know, we'll ask Jerry Adams. He did this. Well, <laughs> well, this is the thing. The, no, no, seriously. That's, that's a point. very interesting point, because the strategy that was employed by the Republican movement and the IRA at a much later stage is about preparing the ground. What happened in late 1921 is that there wasn't perhaps enough communication uh, between the politicians and the IRA. So the flying columns in Cork and Kerry exactly. thought, we're getting a republic. They're, but they're left in the dark. Serious negotiations began in October 1921 in London. De Valera decided that Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith, a prominent Republican and founder of Sinn Féin, should be the main negotiators for the Irish delegation. Griffith was regarded as one of the more moderates. There was the logic, and it, there is logic to it, that if you send Collins, that's important because of his status within the IRA. Does De Valera blindside him, sends him off to London to negotiate? Was he blindsided? He does want to be involved in whatever solution might come about. What he fears is that he is being set up in the sense that he will be the one coming back with the bad news. The newly created state of Northern Ireland was also a direct affront to Collins' desire for a 32-county Irish state. But how could this issue be resolved? Lloyd George appears to have convinced him that the Boundary Commission would be sufficient to end up with the eventual reunification of Ireland. Everyone knew once they signed the treaty that there was going to be some form of partition. You know, uh, 
So what's it, the big fuss all about? So you now know? you like him now. So now you like Michael <laughs> Collins. Yeah, he's a terrorist on the one hand, but he, he was in favour of partition, so he's your mate now. <laughs> but he did, he did think, as the Griffith, which was, again, very naive, they actually thought that they were going to get back Fermanagh, Tyrone, yeah. Derry yeah. City, South Armagh. Yeah. They, they actually thought the rest of it was going to be an uneconomical, unviable rump, which was an honestly, they could have, those, that area of the north, like Belfast, Antrim, Down, and that was the industrial heartbeat of the north. Econ economically, it didn't need for Manor Tyrone. Collins and Griffith and their colleagues were facing a David Lloyd George who was threatening the resumption of immediate and terrible war, and war within three days, if they didn't sign the treaty. Now, you might argue that they should have called his bluff, and Collins and his colleagues are quite tortured, uh, about what to do, but were they in a position to call his bluff? He had concerns that were the war to restart, the IRA would have difficulty going back and just picking up where it had left off in July of 1921. On the 6th of December, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed at 10 Downing Street. Collins later famously wrote, I have signed my own death warrant. De Valera declared that it was in violent opposition to the and the language did get virtually hysterical. Oh, it did. No, the, the, the language. Now, you can understand it. I mean, like, we need to appreciate the atmosphere. Uh, the sense of betrayal uh, is very strong. It divides communities. It divides families. It divides parishes. It's hugely divisive. There was resentment towards Collins, I think, by now, because he was very famous. Senior IRA figures and senior Department of Defence figures say, Michael Collins didn't do all this. He's stealing the limelight for fellas who we know, and in some cases we are the guys who did all these things. And Michael Collins has become a byword for everything that happened in the War of Independence. So some of the animosity in the treaty debates is about a kind of a stolen valour that Michael Collins doesn't necessarily create. It's actually created by the British press. But Michael Collins doesn't disabuse anyone of the fact that he's this daring do figure. And some privately in the Cork IRA, including Tom Barry, would say, sure, he never fired a shot in his life. The North isn't debated hugely. Yeah. You know, there's and a sense... That? That? Because there's a sense that the Boundary Commission will deliver. Mm, right. You know, David Lloyd George had sold the Irish delegation a pup. Yeah. Mm. But it was in their interests at that time not yeah. to fall out over the North. You know, let's wait for the Boundary Review. For and David Devil, at one point, I think, when he talks about if they're going to achieve a republic, he talks about county option. Exactly. Uh, if counties voted to stay yeah. out of the Republic, that was yeah. So he's, he's more or less accepted de facto that there could be a partition. We can't force Ulster. He does actually say that. Surprisingly, a lot of people still don't realise that the, the Irish Civil War between the Republicans and the Free State Forces wasn't about the North. Yeah. Most people thought the North was sorted and that would be sorted out by a boundary commission that the British had sold to them. But it wasn't, it wasn't about the North, it was about an oath of allegiance. To the, the and British that, that would surprise most people of a unionist background who don't really know the story would be surprised to learn that the case. Yeah. They would have thought that the, the Civil War was probably about this idea of partition. The oath of allegiance, it was the most divisive issue and consider it, like this is an oath of fidelity to the British Crown. This is a reminder of the imperial connection remaining. You're staying within the empire. But you have your own army, you have your own flag, you have your own, uh, you know, your own administration. But you, you mean, can, this you is can the paint argument. Your, your post box is green, what more do you want? This is the argument that they could make that we have independence in substance. And of course, Collins famously argued, it's a beginning, it's the not freedom an Freedom to achieve freedom. And you have to consider the perspective of somebody who might have lost somebody or been bereaved during the War of Independence. And they're wondering, is that what they died for? An oath of fidelity to the Crown? The acrimonious debate in the Doyle finally ended on the 7th of January, 1922. It was a narrow victory for those in favour of ratifying the Anglo-Irish Treaty. But the Republican movement was now deeply split. Collins had not taken his eye off the North, and early in 1922, he held two meetings with Northern Ireland's new Prime Minister, James Craig. One moment he was, he was offering this sort of peace pact yeah. with unionists, and then the other, he's still preparing, you know, for the IRA to, to take action against the North, yeah. effectively. So. And it was double speak yeah. because he was preparing and he was arming the IRA and he did lead and was responsible for invasions along the border. So you're the famous Michael Collins? And you're the infamous James Craig. Infamous? How dare you? History will remember me better than it remembers you. Rubbish! The place where I am assassinated, Bail Nabla, will become a national shrine. So what? A statue of me will dominate the hall of the Stormont Parliament I created. Big deal! 
My grave will be the most famous one in Glasnevin Cemetery. I'll have a bridge in London, Derry, named after me. They'll make a blockbuster movie about my life, starring Liam Neeson. That's nothing. I will have an entire town named in my honour. Ah, to be fair, that is quite good. What town? Craig Alvin. And that will be an honour, will it? Well, in a roundabout sort of a way. Craig wasn't living up to his bargain, you know. He was not stopping loyalists, literally killing Catholics for being Catholics. And it was happening on a kind of a, an industrial scale almost um, for the first half of 1922. And Colin genuinely felt for Nashville and he felt he had to do something to protect him because they were not being protected by either British government or the Northern Ireland government. In fact, the Northern Ireland government were complicit, Collins felt, in, in attacks on Catholics. At this time, the Southern IRA was splitting down the middle over the treaty. The one thing they could both agree on was that they didn't want the North to exist. But every time IRA activity was taking place by then, it led to the most dreadful retaliation. Collins was then telegramming the British government, complaining about what he called the Orange Pogrom, um, but it was a consequence of, of IRA activity. Like the rest of Ireland, the IRA had split into pro- and anti-treaty factions. It's estimated that over 70% of the IRA were against the treaty. They felt that they had fought for the Republic and it wasn't for politicians to give it away. The anti-treaty IRA said it did not recognise the legitimacy of the provisional government. And in April 1922, they took over the four courts in Dublin. The four courts was the centre of administration of justice in Ireland. Its seizure was a direct challenge to the new government's authority. Winston Churchill writes to him after the occupation and says, your government must assert itself or perish and be replaced by some other form of control. How is Collins going to respond? And he plays for time. He doesn't want to move against them. Michael Collins, on behalf of Cumna Man, I have to tell you that we totally reject the treaty and stand with our male IRA colleagues in the four courts. You tell them, sister. Och, come on now, what's wrong with the treaty? No true Republican will swear an oath of allegiance to an English king. Hear, hear. Yes, but be reasonable, the treaty is brilliant. Is it now? Oh, yes. The Brits are leaving Ireland, well, well, most of it, and I did it. I got the Brits to exit. I got Brexit done. True, not bad. We're taking back control of our borders. In fact, we might even have an extra border to take control of. OK. And best of all, if you support my treaty, you get the most wonderful thing in the world. What? A green passport. A green passport? Oh, wow. A different coloured passport. That's the best thing ever. Count me in. Oh, come off it. People aren't going to sacrifice their entire economic and social well-being just for a coloured passport. <gasps> Hang on. Oh, that looks fabulous. Up the treaty. It's the assassination of Sir Henry Wilson at his doorstep in London that is the, the last straw. Which many people goes. blame. Collins for, they say he ordered it, but that's... That was believed at the time that Collins had ordered this. We don't have verifiable proof that Collins ordered it. Henry Wilson at that stage was a military advisor to the Northern Ireland government. He's an arch unionist. Yeah, yeah MP as well. Yeah, and he had been chief of the General Imperial Staff. The way David Lloyd George puts it is, if you don't do something about this now, we will. Neville McCready, the commander of the British forces in Ireland, is still in Dublin. There are still 5,000 troops in the Phoenix Park. But Neville McCready is a better reader of the Irish situation than many of those in London, and he says they have to do this themselves. But how are they going to do it? You're going to have to assist them. And they do assist them. And they do use British artillery. And they do need that firepower. But Collins becomes much more decisive then. What he wants is a short, sharp war to bring this to an end. He wore this as Commander-in-Chief of the Irish Army. This would be very familiar to people from that photograph of Michael Collins at Arthur Griffith's funeral. And he was known as the big fella, but he looks like mm. he's about a medium there. Everyone around him was actually quite a lot smaller than him, so mm. he had a good two to three inches on the average male at the time. Six euro for two coffees. That's a great thing about working with somebody from an Ulster Scott. I get the pay for everyone. Well, I thought you were treating me down south here. Yeah, well, see, we're in County Cork. Collins is virtually every... 
There he is. Yeah. Is that life size, is it? The big fella, he's about your height. Stand you beside him. Well, mm, see, okay. Somebody take a photo. I think he's on tip toes, to be honest. <laughs> he's looking well, though, isn't he? There's an idea if we did. Imagine if we had King Billy in shops up, you know, <laughs> all that there. King Billy is about your height, though, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The city of Cork has just fallen into the Free State Army. Michael Collins is going on a tour of the troops and a tour of the vicinity. He sees this as safe territory. This is his home county. These are his people. He's got an armoured car. He's in an open car himself. Collins came up that road earlier in the day on his tour. IRA knew he was in the area, set up an ambush. And he surprisingly came back the way he came. We maybe shouldn't have come mm, back. Yeah. So he was coming down <laughs> that road there. Yes. And the IRA are up on the hill there, uh, and they start shooting at him. He was advised by Emmett Dalton to basically get the hell out of here and don't stop. On Collins's orders, they stopped and engaged their ambushers. Collins got out of the vehicle to fire pot shots back at the IRA. Sonny O'Neill, who was one of the, uh, the anti-treaty IRA men, he had in fact gone off to get a bite to eat at a house just over there. <laughs> and came back later on in the ambush just as it was ending. He just saw this fella standing in the middle of the road firing pot shots at the IRA and he took one shot and hit Collins. So this is the cap that Michael Collins was wearing at Bill the Blow and he was shot in the head. This cap was used to try to stem the blood flow from his head as he was dying. Recent studies carried out did show that there is evidence of an uh, entry wound elsewhere in the cap that would indicate that the bullet probably came from this direction and created an exit wound out the oh, back. Wow. Roger McCauley, one of the leading Belfast IRA figures, said everything was lost after that. And there was total demoralisation. A lot of the IRA men then left the North and went down to the Curragh and, and, and joined the, the National Army. The Irish managed to kill some of their most senior figures who the British had tried to get for five years and had failed. The Irish do that job among themselves in less than a year. There are big speeches made here every year by politicians and they all come and they all say what, you know, what Collins would have said about LGBT rights and Collins would have been on this side and would have supported this, that and the other. Winifred Carney, our great Belfast socialist, who was James Connolly's aide in 1916, she finds Collins doesn't like Connolly, doesn't like Connolly's socialism. And Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, the Irish suffragette, who worked with Collins, she said that he had a touch of the military dictators about him. I think if he had survived, Ireland would be a very different place today. I think Northern Ireland might not have survived as an independent state. You had two very um, strong figures in Collins and Craig. And if Collins had survived, how would that have worked? What would have been the, you know, the chemistry between those two? Would it have led to a resolution? Because Collins was killed at that early age, he can yeah. be all things to all men almost. True, yeah. 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 But so he's a hero to me. Oh, well, know that.